Our scripture this morning is found in Ezra. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. If you're struggling to get back into primary Sunday school and remember where Ezra is, it's in the Old Testament. That's in the front of your Bible, and it's right after the first and seconds. That should help you find it. All right. If you hit the Psalms or any of the prophets, you went too far to the right. Go back toward the front of the book just a little bit, and you'll find it. Ezra chapter 1. And what we're looking at this morning is a proclamation of freedom. You know, yesterday at the Back to School Bash, I had the opportunity to share my testimony with somebody that had never heard it. And, and they honestly were amazed at where I used to be and where God has brought me now. Notice I didn't say where I am now because I didn't get here on my own. I didn't, if, if it had been up to me, I wouldn't be here. God brought me where I am today. And, and honestly, can I be honest with you? I'm going to use a, an old King James word here. He brought me kicking and screaming against the goads all the way. Can I get a witness? Until I finally understood that what God wanted to bring to me was a proclamation of freedom. He wanted to set me free. He wanted to set me free from this world and set me free from the sin that so characterized my life. And so this morning we're going to be looking at the proclamation of freedom that God used a pagan king to make to understand the proclamation of freedom that we have In our Lord Jesus Christ, Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, in honor of the reading of God's Word, let's stand. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord uh, stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuables aside from all that was given as a free will offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had brought or had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Now, this was their number. Thirty gold dishes, a thousand silver dishes, twenty-nine duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls and a se- or of the second kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Sheshbazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst. And God, as you gave to Cyrus this proclamation of freedom for your people back in his day, 
We thank you for the proclamation of freedom that you have given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ in our day. Father, as you illumine the heart and mind of Ezra as you gave to him this perfect and infallible word, we pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds this morning as well. God, we love you so much, and we offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer in and through the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Master. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I know some of y'all are looking ahead and you're going, I think I got something important to do next Sunday morning because you're looking. You're thinking, how in the world is he going to preach a genealogy? Well, we're not going to skip it. We, we, we probably won't read it. So I encourage y'all to read the second chapter of Ezra this week. But we are going to refer back to it, okay? Because Listen to me, beloved. We do believe that this is the Word of God, do we not? We do believe that this is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, do we not? And we do believe what Paul said, that all Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for correction and for instruction. And so we're not going to ignore it. We are going to talk about it, but we may not read it. So y'all don't go, well, I ain't going next Sunday because he's just going to be preaching a genealogy, and that's about as amazing as watching his beard grow. All right. Anyway, we begin this morning a study of the book of Ezra and then Nehemiah. In the ancient Jewish scrolls, this was all one book. Ezra and Nehemiah were all one book because they deal with the same period of time. Okay. It wasn't until later that they were separated into two books the way that we have them now. Now, the events that we have recorded for us this morning, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you that verse 1, all of this took place in 539 B.C. Okay. Cyrus arose to the throne in Persia in 538, and in 539 B.C. he uh, uh, released the captives. Okay, so this book was likely written between 460 and 440 B.C. The emphasis on Ezra, in in the book of Ezra, is the rebuilding of the temple. Now, we're going to look at this when we look at these first few verses. We're going to see that Cyrus is pretty full of himself. We're also going to see that Cyrus has an incorrect understanding of who God is. He has an understanding. How did he get that understanding, beloved? There's a fellow by the name of Daniel, okay, that was his prime minister. Yeah, the Daniel that was in the lion's den, the Daniel that was the prophet, and, and, and wrote one of the books of prophecy that we have in the Old Testament. That Daniel. He was Cyrus's, one of Cyrus's prime ministers. And Daniel was a young man that was on fire for God. <laughs> Just like three of his friends were almost on fire for God. Amen. <laughs> but they came out of that rascal not even smelling like smoke. That's the kind of God we serve. Daniel loved God with all of his heart. In fact, Daniel was willing to put uh, God to the test to show. He, he was a lot like Elijah. Y'all remember that? Elijah, you know, had all these guys that, that were talking about Baal, and, and Elijah had this complex. He thought, I'm outnumbered. I'm, I'm the only godly preacher in all of the country. You know, if I was preaching to a room full of preachers, I'd warn them. If you ever get to that place, brothers, there's something wrong. Okay, you're looking at this thing all together wrong if you think you're the only godly preacher in all of the country. But anyway, Elijah is tired, and God is tired of all of this idolatry. And, and he calls Elijah up onto the mountain, and, and they, they stand up there all day long, and the prophets of Baal try to, to get Baal to light this thing on fire. Okay? I don't want to ruin anybody's day, but that, you know, for the prophets of Baal to ask Baal to, to set that sacrifice on fire, it's kind of like asking the, the Easter bunny to bring me something for Easter. 
Okay. Anyway, Elijah gets up there and he says, I tell you what, boys, we're going to make this a fair fight. Bring some water. <laughs> bring some water. Bring a lot of water. Pour it over the sacrifice. Make sure that wood is good and wet. And then he steps back and he says, God, show them. And fire fell from heaven. Daniel loves God so much that the king is trying to get him and his young men to eat things that aren't kosher. Probably trying to serve them bacon and eggs for, for breakfast and shrimp for supper. I'm on board, by the way. How many of y'all remember when they used to to cook the French fries at McDonald's in, in, in beef fat? Amen. They tasted better, didn't they? But they can't do that anymore. That's that's not part of my message. Anyway, uh, you can tell I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit hungry. <laughs> but not hungry enough to say in our last hymn this morning. No. What I'm trying to say to you is Daniel believed in God so much that he went to, to the guy that had been put over him and said, I tell you what, I love my God so much. I love him and I trust him so much here. I, I'm, going, I'm willing to put him to the test. Why don't you let us eat things that are just kosher? You let us eat just the vegetables and drink nothing but water. And at the end of ten days, see if we aren't in better shape than these other guys that don't believe in God. And, and the guy agreed to it. And then Daniel was, was able to rise to a position of prominence within Cyrus's government and to be one of his prime ministers. And so it came about that in 539 B.C., God stirred the heart of Cyrus. God stirred the heart of Cyrus to make a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom. Ezra is not on the scene yet. We're not going to see Ezra until later on in the book. Okay? Ezra hadn't been born yet. And so he's given to us an account of the stuff that led up to his ministry. The whole point of this book is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. It's the point of Nehemiah as well. Because Nebuchadnezzar had absolutely razed the temple. He had taken it down to the ground to show that his God was stronger than the God of the Israelites. Not really. We understand that. We also understand that God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to... In fact, He even raised Nebuchadnezzar up to do it. Because God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to the people of Israel and Judah trying to call them back to Him, but they wouldn't listen. Well, they listened... But all they did was got mad about what the prophets were saying. We saw that in Jeremiah this morning. In in, in a text in our Sunday school lesson that, that literally showed the last event that occurred before we get to Ezra. With Nebuchadnezzar coming in and and taking over Jerusalem, laying siege to it and and taking it captive. Ezra is a direct descendant of Aaron. And so he stands in the Aaronic priesthood. He's a priest and a scribe. And so that's where his attention is going to be focused. Okay? Ezra 1 through 6 covers the first return of Jews from captivity led by Zerubbabel. A period of 23 years beginning with uh, the edict that is issued in verse 1. And then Ezra 7 through 10 picks up the story more than 60 years later when Ezra led the second group of exiles 
back to Israel in 458 B.C. Now, I want you to imagine. When the exiles came back, okay, when they came back into Jerusalem, can you imagine what they found? The walls had been breached and not been rebuilt. They were torn down. The temple lay in ruins. Some of these people's grandparents or great-grandparents' homes had been torn down. They walked into a city that was absolutely destroyed and not much had been done to fix it back up. And certainly nothing had been done to repair the temple at this point. And so they come back into Jerusalem to something that would have been heartbreaking. But what they're being reminded of is that God keeps His promises to His people. They went into exile. Their ancestors went into exile because God promised they would. God promised that they were going to go into exile because they wouldn't listen to Him and repent. But God promised that after 70 years of exile that He would call them out of exile and bring them back to Jerusalem. And so they are seeing that God keeps His promises. And they lived on. The nation flourished again. The lineage of the Messiah was preserved. And Jesus came out of that some 400 years later. Verses 1 through 4. Have you ever been enslaved? And everybody in this room, your mind just went, I have not. We're just, we're, listen, we're just like the, the Pharisees that Jesus spoke to. And they said, we have never been any man's servant. That's a lie. That's an absolute lie. Everybody in this room is or has been enslaved to sin. And those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ know what it feels like to be liberated, verse 1. We know what it feels like to be liberated. Can you imagine how the American slaves felt when news reached them that they were no longer enslaved, had been set free? I want you to remember, listen, beloved, the reason, the reason most of us struggle in in our later life with, with being apathetic toward people and being angry with people that are sinners is because we forget what it was like to be enslaved to sin. We forget what it felt like when our heart was being dominated by sin. And some of us say, well, I came to Jesus at such an early age. Well, bless God, thank you that you did. But that doesn't change the fact that before you came to Jesus at that early age, you were enslaved to sin. Because, listen, you cannot get saved until you first understand that you were lost. First thing I teach people, Evangelism 101, you cannot get a person saved until you first get them lost. they got to understand that they are lost, that they have a problem. That you're not just asking them to, you know, to have a warm fuzzy about Jesus. You're asking them to go all in on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Zerubbabel in, in, to the group of people that we're looking at this morning is doing and what Ezra will do later on. He's going to these people and he's not giving them a rose garden. He's telling them, look guys, I know you're comfortable here, you know, in, in, in Persia. I know you got a good life. You've got a business. Your family is here. Maybe your mama and daddy lived, you know, just down the street. Your grandparents. Things are comfortable. 
You're well looked after. you got everything you need. But what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Jerusalem. Now, this is a long journey. And they're walking most of the way. We're going to go back to Jerusalem and we're going to repair the walls and we're going to repair the temple and we're going to worship God the way that God told us to worship Him. And if you're not all in, then you just stay right here in slavery. Because even though, verse 1, Cyrus set you free, if you don't leave, you're still a slave. And so that's the message that he would have proclaimed to the people. The exiles were allowed to return to their homeland. Cyrus had a different philosophy than the Babylonians did. We learned that the Babylonians would capture a place and they would separate families and send them as far away from one another as they possibly could. Cyrus wasn't that way. Now let me give you a little bit of background on who this man was. In 559 B.C. he became king over a small territory in modern day Iran. See, we wonder, why are these nations so important? Why is the world's attention focused on these nations? Because so much of what God did focused on these nations. In 550 B.C., he took control of both the Median and the Persian nations, ruling as king over the whole Persian Empire. And throughout the years, he enlarged his empire in all directions. In 539 B.C., he conquered Babylon, modern-day Iraq. See, those two countries have been fighting for a long, long time, beloved. And that extended the Persian Empire over the territory that we know today as Syria, Iraq, Iran, and in Israel. And in 538 B.C., he issued this proclamation of freedom that released the Jewish captives. The prophecies were fulfilled exactly as God's Word predicted. Now, let's, let's look at what what this man understands. Okay, Ezra tells us right up front, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord. In other words, we we saw, I think I skipped over it, didn't I? No. Well, anyway, don't worry about it. In Isaiah, God had prophesied not only that the people were going to be released, but the name of the guy that was going to release them. And so, here we go. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus so that he sent a proclamation and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Well, wait a minute. Who said this? God said it. God said it, but Cyrus is taking credit for it. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Yahweh, the God of heaven. Now, let's stop right there. Most of us, we read that, we don't have a theological problem. But if you keep reading... What Cyrus says here, Cyrus' understanding of God is not biblical. It's not theologically correct. He doesn't have a correct understanding of who God is. To Cyrus, heaven is a place on a map. Okay? Cyrus would have been right at home with Gagarin. When Gagarin said on the first manned space flight... I'm up here in outer space, and I don't see heaven anywhere. That's because heaven is not a place on a map. Anyway, he says, the God of heaven. In other words, to Cyrus, God is just another God. He's given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, now that's true. 
he does correctly understand that God has brought him where he is for this reason and has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, we understand that he may have, you know, not fully understood what he's talking about, but you can't build a house for God. Y'all understand that, right? I mean, we call this the house of the Lord. But if I wanted to send a letter to God, do I address it to 436 Concord Road, Mohawk? God doesn't have an address like you and I do. Whoever there is among you, of all his people, may his God be with him. In other words, I think at some level Cyrus understands, not all of these people understand who Yahweh is. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, he understood, you always go up to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of Yahweh, the God of Israel. The God of Israel. That's an important point. To Cyrus, Yahweh is not his God. He understands him. He's heard about him. But Yahweh is not his God. He's the God of Israel. He's the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle together with a free will offering for the house of God which is in Jerusalem. Verses 5 through 11. News of the proclamation spread like wildfire. Wildfire. They were free to return to their homeland. And it tells us that almost 50,000 people went back to Jerusalem. In fact, it was 49,897, as chapter 2, verses 64 and 65 tell us. 42,360,000. Now, why is that important? He's showing us he's not making these numbers up. If you and I, okay, I'll be honest with you, we don't know for sure. That's why I put in the bulletin. We had 275 to 300 people, okay? That's not gospel. I know we had at least 275, okay? And we may have had as many as 300, maybe more. But I don't know the number for sure. God wants to give you the exact number so that you know that this is true. It really happened. What was behind their decision to return? Verse 5, it tells us, God stirred their hearts. Everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem. Y'all understand that you can you can do whatever you want to, you know. But unless God has stirred your heart, then you're just doing something. You're just doing busy work. We need to make sure that we allow God to, in, to stir our hearts to the things that He wants us to do. The Spirit of God worked in their hearts, stirring them to make a concrete decision to return. Now, the point to note is the returnee's strong, unwavering faith in God. Now, they were going to need this. But now, here's where the, the whole point of predictive prophecy comes in. There wouldn't have been any point unless there were prophecies of restoration to believe. Does that make sense? If Ezra and all of the other prophets are writing their works after the people are already back in, the, in, the, in Jerusalem, and they're making it look like God had prophesied it, but He really didn't, that they were just you know writing this, making it up as they went along, then these people have nothing to stir them to go back to Jerusalem. They're comfortable where they are. They've got everything they need. 
There's zero reason for them to go back to Jerusalem and endure the hardship and the persecution that they're going to endure unless God had prophesied that there was going to be a restoration. Now, we're not going to dwell on it because we're almost out of time. But I want you to note the things that they take back. Okay? He gives a list of all of the things. And it says, Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away. And he put in the house of his gods. And so he had them brought out and he had them counted. They did an inventory. And if you look through that inventory, there are some things that are conspicuously absent. The table of the showbread. The brazen altar. And most importantly, the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to have to wait for Indiana Jones to find the Ark. No, I'm kidding. The point that I'm making is that they're not listed in the inventory of things that Nebuchadnezzar took. So either Nebuchadnezzar had, had them destroyed or they had been gotten out of Jerusalem before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city. So what does any of this have to do with us? The preparation of the returning exiles is a striking picture for us. It shows us how we must be prepared to serve the Lord. First, Titus 3, verses 4 through 7, tells us that we have to be prepared. When the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done. Hello? If you think that God is lucky to have you on His team, you got it exactly backwards. You're lucky God is on your team. That God chose you, that God saved you, not on the basis of what you did, but in spite of what you did, according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly. Amen. Amen. You know, well, I'll let it go. No, I won't. We, listen, when we have the opportunity to get involved in somebody's life, we just won't dole it out. What's the least amount that I can give? God pours it out on us richly. And if you think I'm only talking about money, I am, but I'm not only talking about money. And He did it through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we first have to be saved. Next, we have to ask God to create within us a clean heart. Psalm 51.10. I love the 51st Psalm. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Have you ever tried to, to create within yourself a clean heart? Have you ever tried by your own strength and by your own power to resist sin? Have you gotten to the point yet that you figured out you can't do it? you got to ask God to create within you a clean heart. And to renew a steadfast spirit in you. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, tells us that we got to get rid of the old and put on the new in reference to your former manner of life, that you lay aside the old self. Which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Do you understand what Paul was telling you there? This is a once put it aside, because if you don't, it's going to continue being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. In other words, ask God not only to, to create a clean heart in you, but to renew your mind and put on, make a conscious decision every day to put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. 
We got to present our bodies, Romans 12, 1 and 2, as a living sacrifice to God. We got to obey God and His leadership and listen to the Holy Spirit, John 16, 13. He says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all the truth. That He's going to speak only what He hears. We got to seek first the things of God, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 6. We have to pray continually, Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given. Doesn't say try to get this on your own. Try to scheme and do whatever it is you want. It says ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We got to put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Boy, that'd make a great Bible school, wouldn't it? It did. We got to trust the Lord with all of our heart, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. And we must be prepared materially to serve the Lord. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first His kingdom. Seek first His kingdom. See, we tend to do it last. We try everything on our own. And when our own fails, then we go to God. Jesus said, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things you're striving after will be added unto you. The captivity of the Jews and their return to the promised land is a picture for us. If we turn away from the Lord and become captured by sin or by the lure of the world, we too must make a renewed commitment to go to Jesus. We have to turn away from that sin. We have to turn away from the world and make a commitment to walk in the way that Jesus wants us to walk. Because if we continue to walk in sin, we will destroy any hope of living fruitful and victorious lives. We'll lose the assurance of pleasing God and of living with God eternally. We'll lose the God-given strength to conquer the trials and temptations of this life. And when we come face to face with difficulty, fear and regret will grip our hearts. But there is a proclamation of freedom offered to every one of us this morning. Even if we are gripped by sin and worldliness, we can be set free, liberated by trust in Jesus. All we have to do is repent to turn away from the land of sin and captivity and turn to God and the hope of the promised land of heaven. Will we listen to that proclamation of freedom today and leave from this place free, truly free, genuinely free, free to be the people that God created us to be? Will you come this morning and embrace that proclamation of freedom?